Um, and Mayor, I was just thinking, um, <clears throat> you have often expressed, like, we need to start talking about um, transportation and road issues and road capacity, um, not just here and not just here um, and not just Highway 18 or whatever, but like the mayors need to be talking to each other and to the commissioners. And yeah, I just realized that perhaps that can be, so I've done this series of tours, we know with water, with water systems. <laughs> and then I did, a, I'm in the middle of a series um, of site visits specifically for housing and like affordable housing and shelter, emergency shelters. Oh, yeah. And I wonder whether the next one, so it's like congressional delegation and legislative delegation and then um, mayors who are associated with those, those cities. I wonder if the next one should be specifically around um, transportation. You know, it, I, I would be really happy to see that happen. Um, I, I, we tend to get locked into our own little boxes and we forget that what we do in Carleton as far as uh, transportation is going to affect McMinnville, it will affect Lafayette, Dundee, um, you know, the bypass will affect everybody too. And as they're working on it, we're going to see some real effects from that because there are going to be pieces of the street road that are cut off or closed. And <clears throat> coming up through Carleton and, and uh, Yamhill are a lot of the detours. And as, as McMinnville grows, especially, you know, you and I have talked as McMinnville grows, especially out Baker Street or Baker Creek Road and out that way, those people aren't just, you know, they are not going to be going down to Highway 99 to buck that traffic, you know. Um, yeah, I, I would... think that at some point, um, so there's um, North Hill Road, um, which is, you know, past, um, it's the gravel section, essentially, between yeah. um, Baker Creek yeah. and, um, but it, it comes into Meadow Lake Baker Road. Creek, Meadow Lake, yeah. Yeah. And I can see at some point in the future that being a road that um, if, it, if it was paved, it would be a high throughput road right now. Um, it would be. Not being paved probably helps with that. Yeah. Uh, but, but just looking at it, you know, it's a parallel to West Side, which is a parallel to 47. Yeah, yeah. And for the folks that are with the direction that uh, McMinnville is is building, you know, which they're building out Baker Creek Road and Hill Road that they've got going on there. Uh, for those folks, it's a heck of a lot easier to just come down and hit um, hit Hill Road and come straight on out to to Meadow Lake. And then once they hit Meadow Lake, the thing of it is, once they hit Meadow Lake, they've got two choices there. They can either go up West Side on in through um, Yamhill, or they can come on down and come through Carleton. And I think my suspicion would be that what they're going to do is hit West Side and just go on up West Side. So, and I think if you've if you've talked to Mayor Potter, you you know that they're um, you know. Yam Hill's experiencing some of the same traffic, not the same traffic issues we are, but similar. And and where the roads come in there is right at right at the high school and the um, intermediate. Yeah, it's truly the cars are going into the one spot you don't want people to have lots of people at. Okay. Maybe we all have internet challenges and some of us have more challenging internet challenges. Maybe she will try again. Let, Brent. Let me, let me, she's more important than I am. Let me stop my video and see if that gives her more bandwidth. Maybe that helps. Mayor, do you want to? Oh, no, yeah. It's just, you know, I, I'm technologically challenged and that makes a lot of difference. So I'm I'm going to stop right there. We can talk more later. And Brent. <laughs> okay. Well, that sounds good. Mayor, I'll just I'll start scheduling that um, next round of tours and we'll make yeah. sure that we, we get great. um kind of the regional uh, thoroughfares and growth as the focus. I think part of the challenge is getting people to think outside of their own city limits. 
-hmm. For sure, for sure. But um, when, well, I will say that when there's, um, when intersections get more dangerous, um, the, the collisions and the fatalities are people from our communities, right? They're not people who live in between communities. Yeah, yeah. So, All right, I'll well, thank you for sharing that. Thanks. Yeah, and then Brent, I would invite you to give us an update or into the community um, on the Sheridan project. You know, there's there's not a great deal to update. Where, where we are right now is in the planning process. And, you know, a lot of, you know, I, as I talked about last time, um, a lot of that is based on identifying specifically what the strands are going to be, how those impact the different districts around the county, um, because we are taking a real strong focus on making sure it's a regional program. Um, you know, right now, um, you know, Superintendent Vickery has been reaching out to the other superintendents around the area um, and getting that that regional input is very important. Um, what we're trying to do is make sure that the strands we have don't duplicate strands in other other schools or other districts, because um, we want it to be a, a you know a whiz bang you know thing that people are excited about and that impacts the whole area. Um, so on you know what we're working on right now is we're identifying the strands that we're going to have. We're working with um, the the architects to design how that would look, um, and then you know we're queuing up people who are going to help us figure out how to fund the thing because that's you know I I don't have to tell anyone in this in this group that you know that at the end of the day that's the 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 biggest challenge that anyone faces um, and it's an exciting opportunity, but we need to make sure we're getting the message out there. So it's not just us being excited about it, but it's everyone who's gonna benefit from it being excited also. Well, that makes plenty of sense. All right, thank you. Yeah. And please continue to keep us posted. Absolutely, and 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 I'd encourage people to reach out to to us as well. The, you know, the primary reason mm -hmm. I've been you know, joining into these calls and these calls have been great is to be in a listening mode and to, you know, to, to be able to hear where there, there might be opportunity to, to pull people in. Um, but absolutely, you yeah. know, Abishaw Stone has been incredible. Um, so she's a, she's a route that um, folks, if they want to go through her, if they want to come through me, if they want to contact Superintendent Vickery directly, um, we're all in listening mode, so. Awesome, well, thank you. Yeah. And I'll be sure to direct people to you. you. <laughs> and then I just wanna update folks on um, the um, what looks like in COVID land and what looks like a slowing down of the number of cases per week. And whether that's a reflection of um, that we're testing we're not actually testing enough people or that's a reflection of the fact that there are fewer people getting it. It's hard to know, um, especially given that there are more at-home tests available now. Um, so folks who might be, uh, who might be uh, contagious or might have contracted it may just be at home having had a positive test. Um, but it does also look like um, over time we, have, we had seen a, uh, uh, a change in the ratio between vaccinated and unvaccinated people who were who were testing positive for COVID, um, and we got down to about sixty percent actually, um, where uh, sixty percent of cases were in unvaccinated and forty percent, so a, a slow diminution there. Um, but we have moved back up, so the ratio has changed, so that now it's uh, more of the people who are testing positive are unvaccinated and fewer are vaccinated. So there's this shift going on. Uh, public health has also looked into the data as far as the risk factors, um, and it turns out that in the county right now, you're three times more likely to test positive for COVID if you are unvaccinated. And then you're, it's, I think it's 16 times more likely to be hospitalized if you're unvaccinated. And that, so that's, that's county-specific data that our epidemiologist has pulled together. So it's some significant differences there. 
Um, but as as we potentially have reached either a plateau or a dropping of cases, especially of Omicron in the county um, and across the state, I hope people will remember that the more people who have the virus at one time, the more opportunities there are for mutations. Um, so there's conversations out there about, oh, we're we're done after this and it'll just be endemic. And endemic is like the flu where we have a predictable cycle of here's when there'll be a spike and then here's when there won't be a spike. Um, but this really still is in the who knows stage. And if we find ourselves with a new variant, um, and especially one that doesn't recognize the immunity that we've built up through vaccination and getting sick, um, we could be at this again. And so I hope that people recognize that we're, um, we still need to slow the spread for everybody's sake. Um, even even if, we're, if we're not talking about hospitalizations, the ability for the virus to mutate is, is still real and is still with us. Just thinking for people who are comparing it to the flu, there's the reminder that every year we have a different strain of flu that we have to vaccinate for. So it's not like it goes away or you're 100% immune. Right, that's a really good point. And it's, I think it's something that I didn't, despite having multiple degrees in this, I didn't really grasp is that when people are working on the vaccine or the flu shot for this year, they're like, okay, in Southern Oregon, this is what's predominant right now. And we will get it in three months, we'll start seeing this flu strain. So we'll build um, the, the vaccine for the next season around that particular strain. So it's a prediction basis. Well, I don't have much else besides that because I think that that's the important information is that we are seeing a change in virus dynamics in the county. Um, and I remain hopeful that we will decrease virus transmission enough to really get back to feeling like we can be normal in our lives. But we're not there yet. Thank you very much. For, We're all for looking forward to that it. day, aren't yeah. we? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, and then we will talk more uh, next week. Um, I will have our last housing tour of the of the schedule uh, Friday, in which we'll go to um, three separate sites in Newburgh, and then the the cooperatively owned uh, uh, manufactured home park in McMinnville. Um, and Mayor, if you are interested in joining me, I will just send you the information. But uh, we'll see um, a housing authority owned property in Newburgh. We'll see a, a trailer park or a manufactured home park in Newburgh. Um, and then we'll see Habitat for Humanity homes there um, and an emergency shelter. And then we'll come to McBinville for a cooperatively owned tour. If if you would be, if you wouldn't mind me joining in, um, I would love to have that information. We're, you know, Affordable housing is something we really have concerns about around here and trying to figure out what we're going to do as much as where we're going to put it is, you know, two things. So that totally. would be great. I can visit with our city manager about that. And yeah, that would be great. And the, um, the Newburgh Housing Authority property um, will actually get the, the presentation, the tour um, by Vicki Weibargen, who runs um, Housing Authority of Yamhill County. Um, and she has said that, she, so they're working on a big project um, immediately across um, Highway 18 from their offices um, mm -hmm. on three mile lane, so by the McBinville Hospital. Um, but they said that the, the biggest obstacle up to now with de developing that property was actually finding a piece of land. Um, so if you and Housing Authority have ideas on land, that will be huge. Yeah. Can, can, can I add a comment here? Um, Please, you know, one, one of the things I would encourage everyone um, is not to get too focused into one solution. Um, so, so we have a, a project that we're working on with United Way in the Salem area. And, and so often you see the conversation be, okay, let's talk about this one solution. No, that's not the solution for everyone. There is no solution for everyone. And so we need to have a hundred different solutions that are all happening at the same time. Um, so, you know, what, you, what you're describing, Casey, as far as a tour is phenomenal, where you're looking at all of the different ways, because we need all of them. 
-hmm. Yeah, it's amazing the the diversity of um, the 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 price point, right? Of how much somebody's paying for the space versus um, what you have to go through in order to get emergency shelter at night in the winter. Um, but those are all on the spectrum of what we have to figure out when safely getting people housing. And I might add Sheridan is also um, uh, is, has been helping with getting an apartment complex um, built that um, Yamhill County will be essentially the master renter for. So mm -hmm. tremendous work across the county. Thank you, and thank you for pulling these through and getting them together. Oh, yeah. Yes. I will send that to you when we're done today. And thank you all for joining us today. And we will see you next week. Thank you. Yeah. Nice to see you, Brent. Yep, nice to Bye see you. Bye-bye.